Good morning. It's good to have you here on a beautiful day. Uh, I trust you survived the storms well. Uh, several of our folks were without power here up north for a few days. Thank you to those that kind of pitched in to help or at least offer some freezer space. I think a generator kind of took care of some of the issues that we had, so um, thank you for being willing to serve there. Uh, please be considering how you could give to Resource Health. Emily Heaney uh, has a table there in the lobby, and, and if you just want to give money and let her shop uh, when she's out there, you can give that to her. Um, but this was the ministry of what was formerly Rachel House, now it's Resource Health. And as we uh, celebrate being pro-life, certainly we pray. Um, but then it's pray and kind of fill in the blank. What, what else might you be able to do? And this is a really easy one to take a few dollars and contribute to these tools that they use to, to build this relationship with these young moms. Uh, so if you can help out, make it a little outing this week, go shopping with your kids, pray over those gifts, leave them there in the basket and ask the Lord to use it to be an encouragement. Uh, and perhaps even facilitate the sharing of the gospel with these women in crisis. Uh, so consider how you could help there at the table at Resource Health with your simple gifts. Women of Grace, Bible study, uh, this Thursday morning. So that's July 12th at 9.30 a.m. So that's downstairs in the lower lobby, 9.30 a.m., and it's a Bible study. And oftentimes the question is asked, well, you know, whose book are we using? What? Well, no, it's a Bible study. <laughs> so they're actually studying the Bible. Uh, Colossians chapter 2. So your task is read that chapter and, and come ready to discuss what God is asking of us there, what God is revealing of himself there. Colossians 2, 9.30 on Thursday morning. We have a busy Saturday. Project Shine is in the bulletin. Uh, if you're free and aren't doing some of these other events on Saturday, you can come and serve in uh, the local elementary school. I think it's Spring Branch. Does that sound right? It's just a mile down the road here by the power plant. So uh, that's the, the school where we'll be serving. And it's just cleaning up, a little bit of painting, maybe some outside landscaping. You just show up and they'll, they'll give you a job. And so if you can do that, uh, check your email. There's uh, the link there that'll help you understand that. Um, then there's a bridal shower at noon and also uh, the building uh, property development gang is going to be gathering. Dave, why don't you come and just give a quick word there uh, while I'm on that. Hey, good morning. So uh, we had some uh, folks volunteer and we're off and running with the property development committee. So thanks to you who showed interest in that. On Saturday morning at 9 a.m., the property development committee will get together. We'll just talk about how the committee will work, best way to do business, that kind of thing. But at 10 o'clock, we're going to do a walk around of, of the property, like go in and actually, actually talk about, uh, you know, concepts and things we might or might not do. So anybody's welcome to join in either of those activities. If you're like, oh, maybe I'll volunteer, feel free to come out at 9 o'clock. If you just want to come out and share ideas or, or see what we're talking about, you can come out at 10 o'clock. Uh, so please, uh, please join us if you're interested. Thanks. Congratulations to Dave. Uh, retirement ceremony was Friday. A number of you were there after 30 years uh, retiring as a colonel from our United States Army. So thank you, Dave, and congratulations on that. All right. Um, Mark has an announcement for us as well. My, my announcement's not development, it's just children. But uh, this, is a, this is a Sunday school announcement. Uh, we are in the working stages of planning for a vacation Bible school this summer. It won't be till the end of the summer, just before promotion, July 30th, the, on Sunday. And we'll do it during the Sunday school hour, starting promptly at 9 o'clock. Uh, just to give you a heads up all this, it's to give our Sunday school teachers a little bit of a break. They need that once, once a, a year, uh, like we all need a break every once in a while. It'll be ages four through 11. What we need are volunteers to help teach, volunteers to help as helpers. And if you are interested in that or you feel the Lord prompting you to do that, uh, 
put it on a piece of paper and hand it either to one of our elders, these three gentlemen right here, and they'll give it to me or hand it to me. And I would be at so in July, we'll have a registration form to see how many kids we can expect for the Sunday school hour. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. Uh, but put those dates on your calendar. And again, let the Lord speak to you and don't turn him down. Okay? All right. Thank you. Uh, parents, if you'll help us help your teens this summer, we're trying to do a corporate effort at studying the book of Philippians. So we're going to map out a few verses each day for them to read. And the goal here is to try to let them get online to like a Google document and contribute to a conversation with the teens, myself, and some of the other sponsors. Um, so if you have any questions about how that might unfold, um, any kind of security or safety issues online. Uh, if you'll first steer your questions toward Ben, um, but I'd be happy to talk to you as well. Uh, we just, we want to get our kids accustomed to reading the word and we want them to be able to share what they're seeing in scripture. So there's our goal. The logistics of it are being worked out, but if your child comes to you and says, hey, I'm supposed to get online and do this, at least know something of the background of what's going on there and uh, we'll be happy to work with you as best we can. Uh, I, hey, I saw the Kravishes come in, so we haven't seen you in a little while. Uh, uh, glad you're back, you made a long trip from Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, Dave's basketball season is, is over there, uh, and they have a short summer with a lot of people to see, but we're glad to be able to catch up to David and Ashton, and not so little Declan anymore. Uh, a year does a lot for growth for these little ones. Uh, it's good to see you, thanks for, being here today. Uh, some other visitors as well, and if you feel like you're still kind of a visitor, uh, stick around and learn some names, meet some of the folks. We're glad you're here. Uh, we're here to worship, um, but a part of our being in this body is all these, we can call them announcements, that seems too mundane, but really the life that's going on here in the body. And so thank you to the ones that have shared those events that you're participating in, whether you're helping to give ideas to develop property or share encouraging thoughts with a bride-to-be. This is what's going on. Uh, it's what the Lord's put on our plate, so thank you for being a part of it. But now let's kind of settle our hearts and minds, not only from church life, but also from our individual lives and circumstances, and, and ask the Lord to really help us steer our thoughts to worship, all right? And so... Uh, Dennis will come and call us to worship, and then the instruments will play, uh, and then we'll join them and, and sing. And so I do invite you to just set everything aside at this moment and, and just focus on the greatness of our good God. Um, our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 95, verse 5, and it instructs us, exalt the Lord our God, Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. And let's pray to this great God of ours. Father, we ask this morning that you would be not only pleased with our worship, but be the author of it. Lord, would you direct our minds to the truth and the greatness of who you are, your person, your essence, your set-apartness, your greatness, the power, the good things that you do, the way you've cared for us. We praise you for all these things, but knowing that we're people of short memories, we're people who think first and foremost about ourselves and our wants, and often are remiss to only think after the fact of your goodness. So, Lord, we praise you for your being this morning. We ask that you would put your holiness forefront in our thinking. Help us to stop and contemplate it. I pray that you'll remove all of the distractions of the week or the day and the activities and just help us to dwell on your greatness. Lord, we think about the visions that many of your prophets have seen you and your temple with your train high and lifted up. The saints around the throne casting crowns before you. 
elders, people from all tribes, nations, tongues, and people who praise you this morning around your throne and your church redeemed in this fallen world all over worshiping you this morning. May it crescendo into a beautiful sound. May you be pleased with us. May you correct us so that we will be the right people. We will do the things that you've called us to, the things that will glorify the name of Jesus. May he be most highly exalted this morning in our worship. We ask in his name. Amen.
Good morning. Our scripture reading is going to be in John 21, verses 15 through 19. You can follow along with me. Our Lord and Savior had resurrected from the dead, had made several appearances, and at this time he made an appearance to seven of his disciples. And you can picture on that pebbly beach on the shore, Jesus had a crackling fire and breakfast set out, and after tummies were fed, he talked to Peter and he said when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, You will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to them, follow me. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Help us to know from these words of Jesus to Peter the great assurance that is ours, that our our failures of allegiance, our sin is forgiven by the sufficient sacrifice of Jesus Christ for us. Let us deny the lies of the devil that he will whisper to us about our failures and our sin of the past Let us give him no hearing when it comes to undermining the work of Christ and its sufficiency to cover all of our sin. If there's one here today who is discouraged and constantly looking back and hearing that voice of doubt and shame, would you lift their eyes to see Jesus Christ? the author of our faith and its finisher. Give us great comfort today in your faithfulness and your justice to forgive our sins in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. We're gonna sing a song rooted in Isaiah chapter 61, where the prophet exalts, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Let's stand and sing of this righteous robe, ours in Jesus Christ.
Our affirmation of faith is printed there in the bulletin. If you'll take it, open it, we will read it together. I'll begin reading in the congregation. We'll read the text that's printed there in bold. We'll be reading from the same text that we just sung from Psalm 23. <clears throat> the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely the pray together. Heavenly Father, we are thankful to be gathered in your house this morning as your people. We're thankful that you are our faithful shepherd. You tenderly love and care for us. We are gathered here as your people, as your church, your chosen possession, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and we marvel that you have set your love upon us. We truly are your sheep. We are your flock, following the faithful leading of our great shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. We come with thankful hearts for all that he's done for us and for the privilege of meeting together freely to worship you here. I pray for the persecuted church throughout the world that is forbidden to gather in public to worship you freely. I pray for their protection and for sustaining power in the midst of the great persecution and suffering that they face. Think of the country of Ukraine, your church there. Pray you would sustain and strengthen your people there in these days of continued war and strife. We thank you that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. No human attempts to silence your truth can prevail against the power of the gospel to reach the hearts of your people. As your word is spread across the world, I pray you would use it to transform lives. As it's spread in Cambodia, as the farmers preach to the people there, I think of the Webers ministering to the people of Ghana, Schroeders in Alaska. As your word goes forth, you would use it with power to bring many to yourself, to strengthen those who are yours. We know that as your word goes forth, it never returns void, but it accomplishes every purpose you have for it. So we're thankful we can trust you. Here in this place, I ask you to meet with us this morning. We need your spirit to quicken our hearts, to love you more today and in the week ahead. We are thankful that you are our faithful shepherd. You lead us through bright paths and dark valleys, through times of plenty, times of great need. And you sustain and uphold us with each step we take. We thank you that in all things, you watch for your people. Your eye is ever upon us. Your love ever surrounds us. We thank you for the work of Christ, for his sacrifice on our behalf, that we can stand before you complete and whole, forgiven because of the blood of the Lamb. We pray as we worship and continue in worship in song and in the study of your word, that your spirit would be active here in our hearts opening our eyes to understand the truths of your word. Give our pastor wisdom as he brings the word to us. In all things, may Christ be glorified in all that we do this morning. For we pray in his name. Amen. Our God is our shepherd. He leads us in great faithfulness. 
Let's stand as we sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
1 Peter chapter 5. We're heading to the end of our study of passing through. A study of being followers of Jesus Christ in a hostile world. Thank you for singing well. The voice in heaven will be the voice of many waters as God's people celebrate being complete in Christ. So if you're not hearing the full sound, I encourage you to come sit up front sometime. Uh, You'll hear all these voices singing. Maybe it's that way in the back. I'm just not back there as much. Uh, But take your turn, rotate through up here, uh, and let folks sing to you, uh, speak to you in the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs that we sing. Uh, I think there'll be a picture up here for us. It's a painting uh, done by one of our folks here at church that hangs in my office as a reminder of what a pastor is supposed to do. Now, some people may think of pastors as the ones paid to do the work of the ministry. Uh, They're getting paid to do it, so let them do it. Uh, Others may think that pastors uh, are corporate executives, like some multifaceted CEO running a corporation. Many seem quite comfortable with a pastor who lives like a celebrity, somewhat unapproachable, the face of the franchise, living the lifestyle of the rich and famous. A blog began a few years ago, back before COVID, which documented the extravagant cost of what TV preachers were wearing on their feet. The blog exploded to hundreds of thousands of followers. Many, obviously, questioning the validity of a pastor spending hundreds of dollars and some even thousands of dollars on sneakers. And so, Preachers in Sneakers is the blog. It's still there today. And you can see pastors on their TV programs wearing sneakers as expensive as $5,000 in this show, in this image on social media of their success and of their prosperity. Well, Peter was a pastor, an elder. He had obviously learned some things about being a shepherd from the one who calls himself the good shepherd. And by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he writes to elders, to pastors and their congregations with an exhortation that is notably lacking any mention of corporations or sneakers. And so here, the exhortation from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, is our text this morning. So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief Shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Peter's writing to pilgrims, to exiles, who are facing hostility. They're being insulted, they're being marginalized, they're being harassed. And their greatest need is not corporate reports and budget numbers or a new pair of Nike Air Jordans. Their greatest need is simple care. Care that involves truth and love. Care that is down to earth, personal, instructive. It helps now. Care that is not condescending, 
but kind and humble. So here's our big idea from Peter's exhortation this morning. Shepherds must humbly care for harassed sheep. Remember, our study in 1 Peter is the hostility the church is facing as, as the sheep were harassed from without by the world and as we're warned in Ephesians and Timothy from even danger within, false teaching, wolves. The harassment is there. But in God's plan, there is the steadying care of the shepherds who humbly integrate themselves in the flock, for they too are sheep. But in the role that God has called them to, they provide that stability, care, through their humility and speaking the truth. Shepherds must humbly care for harassed sheep. What does the text say to pastors regarding this humble care? And though you may not be a pastor as part of this church or of any other churches God may lead you to, you should be aware of the standard that God sets out for pastoral leadership. So what does the text say to pastors regarding humble care? I want to point you to four exhortations, four things pastors should know in order to be reminded that their task is to care humbly, but four exhortations you need to hear as a pastor or just a church member, because you need to know what God has designed in his church. Number one. Pastors, in order to humbly care for harassed sheep, need to be willing to learn. Peter begins with a strong word, I exhort. Now, this word in its noun form is the word that we use for the Holy Spirit in John 14. When Jesus says, I will send another comforter. I will send another exhorter. I will send another advocate. A great English word is the word coach. I will send someone to coach you along. In the Greek, the word means to call alongside, um, which could mean you call them to your side in order to tell them something, or you could come alongside them and be calling out instruction. If you've ever watched track and field, especially like in high school, you might see a coach with a stopwatch on the inside of the track in the grassy field, and he's looking at the watch and he's calling out to the runner as they run lap after lap to remind them where they are, pick up the pace, you need to stay with the lead, leader of the pack there. That's our word here. Peter is saying, I exhort the elders. I'm providing some coaching. I'm calling out instructions. Peter is saying, this is important. You need to hear this. You need to learn this. And Peter then references something of his kind of resume as to why he feels like he can be counseling other pastors or elders. And I think from what Peter cites, I want us to see something of what pastors should be willing to learn. Peter first says, I exhort you as a fellow elder. I think Peter would want pastors to learn about unity, to find their place in the fellowship of leaders. I think this points to what the New Testament speaks of elsewhere as a helpful model for the church. Not, not one person in charge kind of sitting at the top of the pyramid like a CEO, but rather one who sits at a table with the other leaders in a plurality as a fellow elder. It's our goal to function that way here. You might answer the question if somebody asked, who's the pastor of your church? You might default to, uh, his name's Adam, because you see me up front as the primary teacher. But in the function of the church, the goal is the elders gather and together hammer out what needs to happen, what needs to be done, what does care look like? Pastor says, learn to find your place as a fellow elder. Learn the lesson of unity. And it's not only unity 
in the one local body. Peter here is addressing churches scattered throughout the area, and he's not necessarily in those churches. But he's saying, I'm a fellow elder. We're shepherding the same big flock, even though God may have assigned us a few sheep here and a few sheep there. What I want us to think here is simply that you'll drive past other Bible-believing churches on your way home and recognize there are fellow elders there as well that stand today and shepherd their flocks, and they're not our enemy. We're not competing with them. Uh, they are in this together with us. Learn about unity. Peter goes on. He's not only a fellow elder giving an exhortation, but he is speaking as one who is a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Now, obviously, in this letter, much is made about the suffering of Christ. In some ways, it's equated to the good news of how sinners can be made right with a holy God. Because in their sin, they are enemies of God. They are under his wrath and his judgment. But because Christ came and suffered for us, ultimately died for us, we, by faith in Jesus, can be forgiven and invited into the fellowship with God. So the sufferings of Christ speak to our salvation. But Peter expands the idea of suffering by calling us to reckon with the possibility that we might identify with Christ not only in his suffering for our salvation, but in his suffering for being righteous. We too may share in that suffering of the godly ones. I think the sufferings of Christ teach us about identity. What it may cost us to identify with Christ. Even as we heard in the prayer for the persecuted church, those who gathering in Christ's name in some parts of our world will prove to be costly. Peter says, learn that lesson of identity, of allegiance, and stand confident in who you are in Christ, even if it costs you, even if it means that you will add to the suffering of Christ. Peter exhorts, as a fellow elder, as a witness to the sufferings of Christ, and as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Peter says, there's a greater hope of true, humble care from pastors if they learn the lesson of worship. Now, I suppose we would think pastors know how to worship. But the reality is, like any function of the Christian life, if we put our head down and fall into the routine of just doing what we do, we can all read our Bibles without any real sense of worship. We can, we can all do the good things we do, providing meals for folks and, and having a good work ethic in the workplace and being a good neighbor and all those good works, but it, it, can, it can lack a fire that burns behind it, that it, all those things are being done as to the Lord and not to men. Peter says, I am exhorting you, other pastors, as a fellow pastor, as someone who knows what suffering means for my salvation and in the Christian life. You heard John 21 where Jesus said, Peter, someday somebody's going to take you to a place you don't want to go. And it says he was speaking of the way he would die. But the conclusion was he still told him, follow me. Peter understood the sufferings, but Peter wants these pastors to know that in calling them to be humble learners, that that learning needs to take place first and foremost just between them and the Lord. They need to learn to worship. They need to remember that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father should inspire awe and wonder that they are worth this vocation of pastoral care. Remember, Peter stood on the Mount of Transfiguration, we call it, and he saw a glimpse. The, the incarnate Christ was, was unveiled just a little bit 
and that glory burst out. And the great takeaway from that mountain experience when Peter wanted to start talking about what to do was the voice from heaven just simply saying, hear him. Stop everything else, Peter. Stop your planning. Stop your ministry strategy and just hear him. Because if you don't hear him, you'll be busy doing all kinds of pastoral ministry. But it may not be done in worship. Peter had to learn to just silence his mind and his gifts and his thoughts and his ideas that were all kingdom oriented, but not really flowing from the worship of Christ. Peter says, I know something of glory. I've, I've seen it. But it's a glory that will ultimately be revealed to all of us. Peter's saying, I don't have a corner on this market of seeing glory. We're all going to see that. So remember, pastors, when you're called to this ministry of humble care of the sheep, and they're harassed and insulted, and the church seems to be scandalized on every front, remember, the church one day will be spotless. It'll be without wrinkle in those righteous robes because the glory will be revealed. And when he appears, John says, we shall be like him for we will see him as he is. In the second coming of Christ, when his glory is revealed, we too will be glorified, Romans 8 says. It's that golden chain that began with God's love set on us from the beginning of time, ultimately culminating in our glorification. It's true, we will be complete in him. Peter, as a fellow elder, as a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as a partaker of the glory that is going to be revealed, instructs pastors to be learners, to be students, to be disciples, not just disciple makers, not just the ones who know and teach others, but the ones who realize there's more to know. Please don't assume that pastors should know it all and remind them they don't, perhaps, once in a while. Instead, expect them to be striving to know more, all the while pointing you to the one who knows all things. The second lesson about humble care comes when we ask the question, what is the actual exhortation Peter is giving? In verse 1, he says, I exhort, but then he talks about himself. What is the actual exhortation? If you look ahead, you'll see it. Verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God. So if we strip away all those extra phrases in verse 1, we have the main verb, I exhort, and what does he exhort? I exhort, you elders, to shepherd the flock of God. You are a shepherd. There's a famous line from a movie, and I don't often cite movies, but I couldn't help think of it as I, as I wrote this down on my notes. You are a shepherd. And I had it underlined, and I had some verses flowing out of it, and I was reminded of Woody telling Buzz Lightyear, You are a toy. Because obviously the movie creates this idea that the toys come alive and children, they don't, okay? Hope that doesn't burst a bubble. But he's trying to convince a toy who is functioning like he's alive that he's just a toy. And he, and he drives it home emphatically, you are a toy. Peter says, I exhort you. As a fellow elder, as a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as a partaker of the glory to be revealed, you are a shepherd. Just 
Just do shepherding. Just do that. Don't do anything else. You don't have to be good at anything else. Just shepherd people. That's what Christ is asking you to do. Do what shepherds do. In John 10, Jesus gives a detailed account of his shepherding of his sheep when he describes himself as the good shepherd. And he, and he gives pictures of bad shepherds that would abandon the flock because they're scared of the wolves and the thieves and the, the faithful shepherds who will sit there and guard the, the gate of the fold and will lay down their lives for the sheep. We have illustrations in the Old Testament of, of shepherd boy David before he's King David and there he is and a bear comes and tries to kill a sheep and a lion comes and, and somehow with his bare hands, eventually he's taking that sheep out of the lion's mouth. Probably used that sling that he had and he's going to war against these enemies. In John 21, Jesus is restoring Peter there. You heard that text read to us earlier. The shepherd is shepherding Peter through his failure, through his betrayal. He's forgiving, he's restoring, he's commissioning, calling Peter. And the language isn't find your, your inner leader, Peter, and excel and take charge and lead them into the battle with bravery and courage. There may be a place for that, but the language Jesus uses is feed my sheep and even tend to the lambs, shepherding. What is it that shepherds do? Shepherds lead. We heard that in Psalm 23. The good shepherd that we trust and when we really trust, we honestly believe that we will lack nothing. It says that shepherd leads us beside still waters. Shepherds lead. Shepherds feed. He feeds us in the green pastures. The psalm went on to say he prepares a table. In the midst of the chaos of our harassment and hostility, in the presence of our enemies, there is this calm, there is this peace, there is this provision because shepherds feed. They nourish. And shepherds protect. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, his rod and his staff, they comfort us. Maybe throw in that sling of David as well. Goodness and mercy leading us homeward through those valleys, through those enemy fields. Shepherds lead, they feed, they protect. Peter doesn't elaborate on all those nuances of shepherding. He simply says, here's my exhortation, shepherd the flock. It's a verb form of that noun, to shepherd them, to lead them, to feed them, to protect them. Do what shepherds do. And then he describes shepherding with this phrase there in verse 2, exercising oversight. Now, oversight is related to another evil word in our society, authority. It's fallen on hard times with the kind of re-rise of critical theory where we where we analyze authority skeptically, where we, where we divide the, the ruled from the rulers, the haves from the have-nots, where we specialize in separating people and causing angst between them. Even in the church, much is being made of abuse of authority. Is there abuse in church leadership? Well, obviously, obviously there is. Our argument is not that there are no bad shepherds. But our argument should be from Scripture, has God designed oversight and leadership and authority for his church? And the answer is yes, because when Peter says, I exhort you to one thing, shepherd, humbly care for harassed sheep, 
but do that by taking oversight, by exercising oversight. And that overseeing is that idea of another title for pastors in the New Testament that we don't use much, the idea of being a bishop. A bishop was an overseer, someone who supervised in a place of authority and leadership. We don't use the word bishop much in church polity, um, but we do and should understand oversight. Oversight speaks to both vision and authority, seeing the big picture of the whole flock and the responsibility to exercise authority in the word. Proverbs would tell us in practical words of wisdom, know the state of your flock. You could apply that to your business. You could apply that to your family. You could apply that to the church. There is an oversight that involves vision and authority. Know the state of your flock and do what needs to be done to get it healthy and prosperous. But this idea of exercising oversight goes hand in hand with another important principle for church life. When we talk about church leadership, the responsibility of pastors, we should come here and recognize that the weight of their doing is oversight. And we say oversight of who or what? I would suggest from Ephesians 4, oversight of those doing the work of the ministry. Clearly, Pastors are called to exercise their gifts in the body for its common good. They, they are doers as well. But if we went to just Ephesians 4 and kind of defined doing proper, we would say the pastor teachers are equipping the saints. That's their doing. But the doing proper, the ministry is for the saints to do. So take oversight, elders. Don't do it all. And just let the sheep sit and stagnate. No, let those sheep exercise themselves in the ministry and do, but oversee them, equip them, help them, give them what they need to be successful in the exercise of their gifts in the service of the chief shepherd. So this oversight isn't a reminder that pastors have all the control if anything, it's a reminder of an emphasis on the sheep and not just the shepherd. They're the overseer. And just like the supervisor of a, a massive Amazon warehouse, he might not ship a single box. He might not put anything in a box. He might not know how to use a tape gun. He might not know how to fix the assembly line or the, the conveyor belts. And so I guess somebody could charge him with not doing anything. But the reality is he's supervising to make sure all that stuff can get done, even if he's not doing it. The doing was getting done by all the people, the hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of Amazon employees. So don't hear oversight and think, oh, here we go. It's that authority and leadership and they're in charge. No, think instead, wait a minute, as, as a sheep in Ephesians 4, I'm supposed to be exercising my gift and receiving instruction and direction and equipping from those that God has called to lead in those ways. Shepherds lead, feed, and protect while they oversee. Shepherds, remember, were a lower class of society, in Bible times, even in Jesus' day. So there was no elitism here in Peter using the verb shepherd the flock. A little more status would come with oversee the flock. But shepherding, not as much. No elitism, no privilege, no status, just lowly shepherding. But it reminds us that pastors don't need vast influence. It's not the calling. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. There's an old adage of an old retiring preacher to a young guy who was aspiring for a bigger church. 
And the general gist of it is this. When you stand before God, you will think you had enough to be accountable for, no matter how small your flock. Shepherd the flock among you, shepherds. What has God set before you? For me, that's easy. I stand here with no one behind me at the moment, and I look out, and, and this is the flock. Oh, not everyone's here today. But as shepherds, the calling is right here. Not necessarily, what else can we do, and what else can we offer to get more people in here, and how do we get to look like one of those really successful churches? No. Just shepherd. Just do what shepherds do. Pastors don't need vast influence. Congregational size doesn't validate pastoral prowess. Peter says, you are a shepherd. Just stick to that. Don't worry about building an empire, a massive financial institution. Don't worry about whether you have a school and a seminary and everything else, just care for harassed sheep. They're trying to follow Jesus, and yet they're going to a workplace that's making them smile and be more tolerant and inclusive and deal with all kinds of nonsense. They just need care. They don't need a big building. They don't need a big budget. Just care. You're a shepherd. Third lesson, and it comes because when you ask a sinful human to assume a place of authority, things can indeed get messy. So Peter warns shepherds to avoid small, selfish thinking. Small, because they should be thinking bigger, God's church and the kingdom. Selfish, because Peter wants to make it clear with three phrases that it's not about you. First, Peter says, shepherd the flock, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly. His point is it's not just a job. It should be a desire. The willingness that Peter speaks of here is an eagerness. Do this because you want it. It's interesting that we see this similar thought in 1 Timothy. If any man desires the office of a bishop, that's a good thing to desire. It's not just a job. Pastors should willingly embrace the care of God's church. Oh, I'm not saying that every problem that arises is just joy and happiness. But the idea is when you step back and see what's going on, while all of us are inconvenienced when our plans get rearranged and you're called out to help and, and, and you've done that as much as pastors have in some ways. We know it doesn't always feel like joy, but we understand the joy of serving and loving others. Not just a job, but it's a desire. Secondly, he says, not under... Or, Exercise oversight, shepherding the flock, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. And just so you note in your English Bibles there, I do this when I write out the text. I put in parentheses the words that aren't there in the original Greek, words that are there to help us understand it. And the words that aren't there as are would have you. The text simply says, not under compulsion, but willingly as God. Don't act as God, but in the same willingness that Jesus said, the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes after that lost sheep who in his foolishness wandered away with the same eagerness to make that right and to fix and to shepherd. With that kind of eagerness, you do your calling, your commission. But then Peter says, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. And admittedly, it's hard to hear the contrast. Not this, but this. Not for shameful gain, we understand that. But what's the contrast to eagerly? And that that word leaves us hanging and anticipating more. 
So we could say it this way, not for selfish gain, but for gain that will prosper others. We're not eager for our own gain, but we're eager for someone else to, to take a step forward, to, to overcome that addiction, to get some teaching so that they can combat that false idea, to learn how to get victory by the help of the Spirit over their anger. So care and exercise authority and do what you do, shepherds, but do it in such a way that it's, it's not just so that you gain popularity, a paycheck, but the gain you're after is the next spiritual step forward for the sheep. Pastors should seek the good of those in their care, and that means at times God may even meet, move folks on to other places. Churches, and especially pastors, hate to see people go. And when they say, you know, we really think God's moving us on, or I'm going to take this job and it moves me across the country, your first thought is, oh, I don't know if God's doing that. <laughs> you want them to stay, but the reality is you're not in charge. And you should want, as a pastor, what is best for that sheep, even if that means God's going to graduate them on to something else. Third, Peter says, do this work of shepherding, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples. So it's not about being elite. It's not a class system. There is the clergy, the pastoral team, and then there's the rest of the church members. No, we do ourselves a disservice when we fail to view under shepherds, pastors, as also part of the flock, in a sense. They too are sheep. Their gifts uh, are expressed a little more publicly at times, uh, but to understand that their, their task is not to domineer over those in their charge and see that word charge and see that it's valid. Yes, they do have some charge over, but not in a domineering way, but being examples. So pastors shouldn't crassly demand growth and godliness but should carefully demonstrate it. Paul instructs the church, and he tells them, see how we lived among you. And then he goes a step further in other letters and says, be imitators of us, even as we follow Christ. So pastoral ministry is not a show of strength, but rather a show of spirituality. Pastors are supposed to say, this is how it's done. And obviously, they, they won't be the, the perfect example of every gift and ability in the spiritual life. But as, as the general Christian life of discipleship, they should be examples. And this is why the common person in the pew usually has what we could call a gut sense about certain situations and I've been around long enough on other pastoral staffs and around a lot of church people. And in the staff meeting, there's kind of a harsh word would be a cover up. Uh, a, a lesser word would be they're, they're trying to figure out how this is going to work and what should be done about this problem. And when you lay it before the, the common church person, they're thinking, why is that guy on the pastoral team? The people behind closed doors that should know better are trying to think, well, I don't know, maybe it's this, maybe that. And well, if he, if he comes around a little bit and there's a, just a gut reaction, maybe a better word is a spirit filled wisdom that just says, no, that's not the example of what a pastor should be. He shouldn't be doing that. Peter kind of makes it pretty simple. Pastors. Don't tell everybody that you're a great leader. Don't tell everybody how gifted you are. Don't tell everybody that you're the cream of the crop, that you're the upper echelon, that you're a somebody. No, just live out the spirituality and you should have somebody eventually saying, I'm just curious, how did that, how did that work for you in raising kids? Or, or how, how do you do this in your marriage? Or how do you, how do you study the word that way? Demonstrate it. Be an example to the flock. 
Pastors will be helped in their pursuit of humble care. Fourth, if they hear Peter's challenge to be confident of glory. Be confident of glory. Peter lays out the exhortation. Sounds simple enough. Shepherd the flock, exercising oversight. He qualifies it. Make sure you have the right heart in this. That's important. And then he kind of steps back and he reminds them. Now, listen, that's the challenge. That's the exhortation. You are to humbly care for harassed sheep. Now, I feel a weight of that responsibility, but I, I think truly understanding care for harassed sheep would be more weighty in some tangible sense if I had pastored a congregation in the Ukraine. We prayed for that nation earlier and the church there. And to realize the enorm enormous turmoil, the way life has been completely turned upside down, would put front and center the idea of the sheep are harassed. But if we're really honest, and you as sheep began to describe just with, with full freedom to express openly the things that harass you, the things that will fill your mind this week in those quiet moments and cause enormous fear, great guilt, sorrow, longing, those things remind us that we as sheep in our free nation, miles removed from missiles and warfare, we too are harassed. And so the job's the same here as it would be in war-torn Ukraine. And the great hope in the midst of all those problems, because when you start caring and you start hearing this problem and this burden and this care and this uncertainty and this struggle and this addiction and this haunting guilt and this depression, all these problems start swelling and we think, what's the hope? Who is sufficient for humbly caring for, for this many needs? And Peter says, okay, step back. And before we're all overwhelmed, let's remember that there is a chief shepherd. And that chief shepherd is going to appear and he's going to make everything right. And he'll dry every tear and satisfy every longing and meet every sorrow with comfort. And our faith... Our longings, our hopes are made sight. We stop hoping, we stop, we stop wondering and trusting blindly, you know. We won't need faith and hope. We will be face to face with the chief shepherd. No longer harassed, Revelation tells us. Be confident of that, Peter says. The glory that is to come. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. The chief shepherd, literally the arch shepherd. When he appears, you will receive, and it's not the basic word, there's a common word in Greek that it, when you're learning verb endings, it's the first verb, the first word you learn in Greek 101. But it's not the word to just receive. It's the word for more of a reward, a recompense. It's what you've earned. And what is that earning? What is that reward? You're going to receive, the text says, an unfading crown of glory. Now, a couple crowns in the New Testament. One, you'd recognize the word diadem. It's the kingly crown. I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. The queen celebrated her 70 years on the throne. Great Britain has a crown, a diadem for that monarch. This is not the kingly crown. You won't be crowned king when you get to heaven, pastor or otherwise. 
that's reserved for someone else. But yours can be this crown, the Stephanos, the Greek word. It's the victor's crown. It's, it's the wreath. It's the bouquet of flowers or uh, a commissioned gold, silver, or bronze medal that the athlete receives when he stands on the podium as first, second, or third place among all the athletes of the world. It's that crown, a crown, a wreath. It's just representative of, of accomplishment and success and achievement. Peter says, when the good shepherd appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. You'll be recognized for having run the race faithfully. And the crown is glory. You will receive a crown of glory. You will receive a crown which is renamed as glory. So drop the crown and you will receive glory. That's what it will be. You will share in Christ's sufferings and pastoral ministry. You will share in Christ's glory. And Peter said this exact thing in chapter 1. We heard it then and now it's kind of coming to bear on the fact that, yes, life in the church is hard. We're harassed because we live in a hostile world. But we can care for one another and especially shepherds should care for the sheep. And we can all bear in mind that the harassment will end, that the struggle will end, that the guilt will fall away, that the depression will never raise its head again, that temptation to sin will never be dealt with again, that brokenness and disease and cancer and disability will never again be known. Instead, it will only be glory. Glory, not our own, but glory shared. Glory received, glory enjoyed, glory lived in. It will be the air we breathe, glory to the Lamb. When the chief shepherd appears, this will be the state of your existence, glory. So take heart. I know this life is hard. I know it's hard to be a sheep harassed by this world. Peter says, I know it's hard to be a shepherd harassed yourself and caring for sheep. But keep your eye on the glory that is to be revealed, on the crown. You don't think it's hard to run a marathon in the Olympics? And most of those races in the hot August days take you all through the host city and countryside, and then it finishes with a last lap or two into the stadium. And everything in their body is shutting down, sometimes physically. Harm is happening by this point in the marathon. And yet they press on for the hope of the crown of glory. Humility can be a tough pill to swallow. But it goes down a bit easier when you remember that humility leads to glory. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Two conclusions. One, we have several pastors here at Grace Bible Church. Lord willing and spirit gifting, there will be more. To the pastors, this text is clear. Do the work of shepherding. And do it knowing that you are accountable to and rewarded by the chief shepherd. Number two, the majority here are not pastors. The text about pastoral care weighs heavily on you as well, though differently. To you, the text says, respond to pastoral care. Obey your leaders and submit to them, Hebrews tells us, for they are keeping watch over your souls. So let us all hear this exhortation. This coach, Peter, who comes alongside this morning and calls to us, you are a shepherd, or obey your shepherds, though imperfectly they care for your souls. Heavenly Father,
the inadequacy weighs heavy when we compare ourselves to the chief shepherd. So lift our eyes to this author and finisher of our faith, Jesus. Raise up leaders among us who will tackle head on this care of your sheep with love, with truth, with a concern for your flock, which has been purchased with your own blood. And in every failure of pastoral care, remind us that Jesus, our good shepherd, never fails us. If he be our shepherd, we will lack nothing. By your word today, would you make us what we should be as pastoral leaders and as submissive followers? We receive your word today with thanksgiving for your good design for your church, for your faithful promises that we will be led all the way home, and for this reminder to care for one another in all of our harassments, in all of our struggles. Thank you for promising to bring us home to glory. We receive these promises with hope in Jesus' name. Amen. We close with this word from Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.